So, good morning. Good morning. It's very nice to see you all after the reception yesterday that you already are awake and here. <laughs> That's good. Okay. It's harder tomorrow after the dinner. So, I'm Max Petzold and um, heading the Swedish National Data Service. Um, and I'm also one of the co organizers of the event here, of course. Um, and this morning we will uh, talk about indicators and uh, a project that we are running to look into innovative indicators to try to be able to measure what is happening. This is, of course, done in a number of different projects uh, globally, but um, yeah, we are trying to add one perspective from our side. So... Uh, so what we will do today is I will give a short introduction, uh, telling why we are here and what we are doing. Uh, and then um, I will show you a first draft of uh, indicators. And then Marilyn De Smith will continue with um, giving some examples. Uh, and we will have an open discussion led by Lorenzo. Um, and yeah, ending at somewhere at the end, of course. <laughs> Good. So, what are we doing? Um, there is a lot of changes globally. I mean, a number of countries, a number of institutions that are working with open data in different ways. And uh, in Sweden, there is a major change that 2026 all publicly uh, funded data should be made available and well documented and yeah, fair in different ways. Um, so this left hand side is in Swedish, uh, but it's just to show the, uh, the importance of this. It's actually a governmental decision uh, and it's in the budget uh, proposition. So it's one of the most important documents and also in the research proposition. This is the research proposition here, but the, uh, the money is talking, so that's important. Uh, and the overall aim of this project is to try to identify optimal indicators, uh, of course, utilizing what has been done in other projects and uh, trying to merge things together. Uh, identify indicators that can be extracted um, in the current metadata landscape, open as well as uh, proprietary data. Uh, and that's a little bit the unique thing that we are working with both sources here. And then, of course, suggest improvements in metadata practice, so registration, coverage, uh, and also policies, of course. So trying to see what is possible to be done today based on both sources of data and how could we improve it. So uh, it's a small project. Uh, it's the Swedish National Data Service and three universities and ELSEFI that is doing this uh, joint work. Uh, so it's Stockholm University, University of Gothenburg and Karolinska Institute, uh, the universities. And so far we have had a kickoff meeting in January and then a full day workshop in Stockholm and a couple of online meetings. And what we will present today is what we have been able to do so far, but then there is a continuation afterwards to continue this um, collaborative work and hopefully bringing more uh, collaborators into the work. So the first uh, draft of indicators. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like. Now this is from the workshop where we, of course, in the traditional way, uh, came up with a lot of ideas and then trying to get it into something that could be used in practice. Uh, and what we have done uh, based on these wild thoughts is to try to sort them in different levels. So the national level, institutional level, uh, research behaviors and outcome indicators. So trying to measure all these different levels of performance. And I will go through these four different sections uh, and show you what indicators so far that we have identified. So the first level, uh, the national level, so the baseline, you can say, uh, we have four different areas, infrastructure, uh, funder guidelines, institutional guidelines, and rewards. Um, I will not read all of this, but um, the uh, specific indicators is, is there a national data register or registers? 
share of institutions with a data repository and that kind of um, uh, basic indicators. And then uh, funders, if they're requesting data sharing, of course, so national funders. Uh, are the guidelines enforced is, of course, important. And then uh, uh, institutional guidelines, share of institutions with guidelines describing how to publish data sets. Uh, so all this that really make things happen. And rewards. Um, are there national guidelines in place to reward open data? So what is in it for the researchers, you can say. So an example is uh, like University of Gothenburg, I'm trying to push for when we recruit people that also open science should be one of the um, main, um, what you can say, uh, ah, now I lost the word, but uh, when you try to assess ap applicants that also open science should be one of the main parts in this assessment. Uh, so that's one an example. Um, and then the institutional level practices. Uh, so we have infrastructure and support, guidelines and rewards. So now we are down or up in this pyramid, one more level closer to the outcomes. Uh, does the institution have a data repository? So a little bit more, more fine-tuned here. Uh, share of institution track uh, data sets in their system, so using CRIS systems and other uh, administrative systems for tracking. Uh, number of support personnel per 100 researchers, so that kind of measures. Is there, are we really following the development and how are we supporting the researchers? And then guidelines, so more local guidelines at the institutional level. And uh, the rewards, so also down on the institution level, so not just on the national level, but also going to the real employers. I'll give you some seconds to read here. Uh, and then the researchers' behaviors, so share raw data. I mean, um, we need to have better information about the sharing. Uh, here, we have no indicator for the moment because there is a lack of information. We are, of course, working on this, but this is one of the clear suggestions. I mean, how to try to improve that. And that's, of course, a well-known uh, problem, but it appears here also. So we need to push for the, um, to have a push from the community for the creation of new metadata fields so really showing uh, is this uh, raw data or is it something else that we are sharing? Having good metadata, uh, of course, uh, so different um, levels here, uh, author information, author IDs, affiliation information, um, country information, percentage of data sets with grant IDs, funder information, funder IDs, percentage of data sets with a discipline or keywords. Uh, and then the, the citations, so percentage of data sets um, with data site citations, um, percentage of data sets re referenced in the articles, but perhaps not in data site, uh, percentage of data sets mentioned in full text of a uh, paper, and that's of course a little bit more uh, advanced to find this information, so that's also something that we are working on. So what we would like is uh, some kind of uh, circle where uh, uh, we can see if the researchers are reusing available research data, if the researchers are sharing their research data and complying with funders and institutions and publishers uh, mandates. Um, to what extent does shared research data adopt fair principles? And of course the credit, the reward part that is important. So finding indicators that could push the development in different ways and measure the development. And the last level, outcome indicators. Uh, so four different families of indicators, publish more data sets, uh, data shared for any publication, data shared for any grant. 
So uh, again, number of data sets and hopefully per discipline in some way, uh, all these issues about defining uh, disciplines and of course, cross-discipline research. We have a lot of complications here. Uh, percentage of data sets with grant ID, uh, percentage of grants with linked data sets, and percentage of data sets with grant ID also for the um, last point here. And then again, grants with the linked data sets. So you see the, the same indicators, of course, appear in a number of places here. So, um, of course, fair is essential in this. So trying to have um, uh, data sets with the PID, with the readme file, machine readability, um, license is important, and uh, documentation then, percentage of data sets with the readme file. So different levels here, trying to fulfill the uh, FAIR and measuring the FAIR compliance on a national level and institutional level and research level. Um, and the reuse, uh, citations from publications, citations from other sources of metrics, and downloads. And downloads is especially complicated. As everyone who is running a repository knows that you have all thousands of downloads from different machines and how to count this. Um, it's really complicated, but something we need to try to sort out in a better way. So what we have done so far is trying to sort out this and then going to the next level that Merlin is going to present. Uh, is this possible to measure uh, based on the two sources of data here? So the open sources and the more locked sources. So please, Merlin. So can you hear me? Good. So I'm going to walk you through some of the um, prelim prelim preliminary results that our partners for Elsevier have produced on the basis of our discussions at a workshop in January and otherwise during the winter. And the material I'm going to present is based on the research data monitor from Elsevier, which contains over 20 million records from Sweden about 8% of these can be connected to a publication scopus, which means that we can get good metadata from those records. And the majority of these records are identified as data sets. This classification is basically dependent on the repository metadata. For any further information, I'm going to refer to my colleagues from Elsevier. Now, this is very much ongoing work. We haven't got all the information we want yet. Um, with regards to Sweden, we're getting there. There's also currently a survey being conducted by the Swedish Research Council, which is also going to provide us with interesting information on a national level. However, I'm going to present some of the outcome indicators that we have gotten so far for Sweden. And the first of these is the basic evolution of research uh, rec data records per year. And if you look at this, you see this very big spike in 2018. And this is due to a single deposition of slightly more than 10,000 records to an astrophysical repository in Potsdam from the University of Stockholm. If we ignore that spike, what we see is basically decent growth from uh, 2013 to basically 2017, but it's going to stagnate slightly after that. And that's going to be a pattern that's going to repeat a lot in the results we've gotten. So big growth in published research data to basically 2017, 2018, but after that, slow growth, if any. Now looking at the research data, the records per discipline. Some things that are kind of striking is that Sweden has a high proportion of medicine data compared to the rest of EU. Also biological, biochemistry data is very well represented in Sweden and agricultural and biological sciences. And I think I'm going to find a reason for that later on during this presentation. 
Um, we are going to work on a unified classification according to the scientific field. Looking at just the share of publications with le ringed least reaches data records, meaning the 8% in the original data. Here again, we see a pattern that we have decent growth until about 2017, which is then sort of leveling off. These data are kind of preliminary though. We might still have results coming in for 2021 and 2022. But as it stands now, on the average for 2020-2022, about 3.4% of all publications had linked research records. For open access publications, the percentage is higher, 4.6%. Looking at the top 10 institutions in Sweden, the first thing you notice is that Stockholm has a very high proportion of published research data records, but a low percentage of those that are linked to an article. And this might be very much due to that spike I talked about earlier. If we would correct for that, Sweden would look a lot more like the other institutions. The other thing I'm noticing is that Karolinska, the medical university, has a pretty high proportion of data sets that are linked to a publication which I'm wondering might be connected to publication practices in that specific field. The third thing I'm noticing is that the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences is ahead of a number of more general universities, as well as the Royal Technical High School, in terms of publishing data. And we earlier saw that Sweden has quite a high proportion of agricultural and bio biological data being published. Now, in terms of grant information for recent data, record, data records that are not linked to a publication, only 3% contain grant information. But with recent data records that are linked, it's up to 21%. Uh, funder information is a bit more widely present in 7% of all research data records. And again, a lot more with research data records that are linked to a publication, up to 51%. This might be probably due to publishers wanting funder and grant information in published articles, which is then extended also to research data records. In terms of license, the majority of Swedish research data, data records have a public license or a non-commercial license. Um, however, this is not a case for records that are linked to a publication. Here, only 40% have a public non-commercial license. A specific, explicit public non-commercial license is, of course, an indicator of reusability, meaning another researcher knows what he is allowed or not allowed to do with this data. But I wonder if it could also be a kind of indirect indicator for good metadata in general, meaning if a research data record has a specific license, the other metadata is probably in place as well. I don't know, but I'm wondering if this might be the case. However, now I'll move on to Sweden. And if we first look at the institution level indicators, I'm moving on to Stockholm, I'm sorry, my home university. Does the institution have a data repository? Yes, we have several repositories in which secure data sets, both general in fixed share and one specific for climate science. As to tracking data sets in our systems, we're working on that. We have a good overview of what is published in the repositories we have control over, but we're trying to work on getting a better grip on what researchers are doing outside of our repositories, which is quite a lot. And this is kind of back of the envelope calculation, but I would guess that we would have about a quarter of uh, support personnel per 100 researchers. Now, guidelines to publish and to encourage data sharing 
are in place. Guidelines encouraging researchers to publish reviewed curated data sets, not explicitly, but we do provide repositories in which we curate data sets. Um, currently, only one of the repositories where we curate data sets has quarter seal, which is the Swedish National Data Service. As to taking into account data sharing to reward researchers, no, not to my knowledge at least. Institutions track publications because funding, research funding for institutions is dependent on the number of publications. But to my, to my knowledge, published data is not taken into account here. However, I do not have an exact overview of what goes on at each individual department. There are departments where publishing data has become very common practice at Stockholm University, and there's probably some reason for that. Looking at the distribution of authors based on the number of data sets here on the um, x-axis from one to over 20. Oh, sorry, the y-axis, of course. No, the, no, the x-axis, and the number of authors on the y-axis. Now, they're all split according to seniority, with early career researchers in blue, mid-career researchers in orange, and experience researchers in gray. Now, what I would like to see if research data publishing becomes one common practice, meaning an author just, do it, just doesn't do it once, but keeps on publishing data, is an increase in more experienced researchers publishing data, publishing more data sets later on. And we're sort of kind of seeing that. the At least the proportion of mid-level researchers that have two or 3.5, three to five um, data set published is slightly higher in 2018 to 2023 than it was in 2013, 2017, but it's not a very clear development. I would have liked to see something more clear here. If we compare outcome indicators for Stockholm University with the rest of Sweden, at Stockholm University, we're good at publishing data sets with public non-commercial license. Also, the percentage of open access and general publications with a linked data set is pretty good. But we see that Stockholm is leveling off in recent years to a bigger extent than Sweden in general. We do not yet have data for the average number of citations per 100 data sets. Or actually, we do have the data, but it's not kind of totally ready yet. We're working on it. Now, here on the blue line, we see the total number of published data sets, including the spike, with the number of thousands on the left y-axis. And the orange line corrects for the spike with the number in hundreds on the right y-axis. And again, we see the same pattern here, at least if we look at the percentage that's corrected for the spike, the orange line. Big growth from 2013 to 2017, which is actually leveling off or even decreasing slightly in later years. And if we keep in mind the aim to have open data by 2026, this is not really what we would like to see. What I would like to see is kind of an accelerating development to a point of where sharing data becomes common practice. But that is not what this data shows, unfortunately. Looking at the share of publications with research, research data records, again, the same kind of pattern. Strong growth until 2017, which is plateauing after that. This uh, graph is split with open access publications in orange and the total in blue. Now, this indication of that publishing data is sort of leveling off in recent years is kind of consonant with my own limited experience. At least in the repositories we are curating at Stockholm University, we're not seeing the kind of increase in published data we would want to see. 
it's the development's pretty much level in recent years. And finally, proportion of research data records with a public or non-commercial license. Again, more than 80% of research data records at Stockholm University are, have a public or non-commercial license, which is pretty good, which is higher than the average of Sweden, which would be at 53%. However, it's the opposite for records that are linked to a publication. Here, only 24% have a public or non-commercial license, which is lower than the rest of Sweden. So Stockholm University is sort of diverging from the rest in this respect. I think this is pretty much it for Sweden and Stockholm University. So I'll now hand over to yeah, Lorenzo. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you, Max, for sharing these insights. So we would like to use this time now for an open discussion. As Max and Merlin presented or explained, this is very much work in progress. So we wanted to be here actually to get a chance to present this to the community and get your ideas to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, so I'm going to open now the discussion forum. We also have some questions prepared, but are there any questions, any thoughts from the audience? Um, I know we have a mic, uh, perhaps, yeah, can you help with the mic? Check. Uh, hi, uh, Jeremy Gielen from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, thank you for the presentation and congratulations on the work. Uh, I find it excellent. I did have one uh, question, uh, a clarification. Did you take into consideration and in what way um, data sets that are subject to controlled access, uh, for example, in medical fields, when uh, doing your work and working out the numbers? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's more complicated. It has a pretty significant complication, but uh, just curious. Do you want to yeah, take sure. that? Yeah. Um, we do realize that there is there are differences per discipline. The first difficulty is assigning a discipline to a data set. Because what happens is a fair proportion has something like a discipline assigned by the repository, but it differs from one repository to another. So one of the analysis we're trying to run is trying to homogenize this. And so being able to assign the same classification to all data sets, once we have this, we should be able to try and um, field weight or take into account the fields in our analysis but we need to, to do the first step first. So for the moment, the only fraction where we could safely assign a discipline are the data sets linked to a publication, because then we have the discipline of the publication. But yes, we do have this in mind as much as possible to try and take the field into account, because otherwise it doesn't mean much. I just... Uh... Yeah, so it wasn't so much a question about field, it was more a question about um, ability to track. So, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, in Canada, you, you might have data sets within a repository run by like the Heart and Lung Institute, and I don't know if they're tracked within Scopus or, or, or whatnot. Um, so, and, and there's like an access procedure to uh, view them, like the metadata might not be available uh, publicly, that type of thing. But thanks for your answer. It was still enlightening, but that, that was also part of my question. I think uh, I, I, I could add uh, some details there. Uh, we do uh, index uh, some repositories uh, which pub publish uh, sensitive data uh, with metadata only uh, in a restricted manner. So yes, they are included, um, but uh, we can't account for uh, all research projects because there are different publishing practices. But for example, uh, when it comes to the Swedish uh, National Data Service repository, we do uh, provide facilities to um, to publish uh, sensitive data um, with only the metadata and and a um, a method of of, of contacting and and requesting um, access to the data. Thank you, Andre. And perhaps let me add that's the um, from a repository perspective. This analysis is based on um, pretty much the data sites 
uh, set of repositories with a few additions of a couple of repositories which are not in data site, but by and large, you can think of data site as the main uh, corpus here, just to give you a sense. And I know I'm going to repeat this a few times, but we are starting now. So this is where we are today. We are offering a snapshot of where we are today. And by doing this type of project, we also want to see in which direction we need to expand, you know, perhaps in areas like you suggest or others, as I'm sure they will emerge from this discussion. But thank you. Yeah, um, Paolo. I have two points to make. So <clears throat> the first one is related with uh, what our colleagues just mentioned. So uh, I think the whole presentation missed a little bit the, the glossary. So to understand what is a data set for you, resource data set, because that's not clear. No, it's not clear for the majority of the people out there, but at least in a study like this, I think you should be clear. So are you including software in there? Are you including thematic repositories? Are you including scientific databases? Or is it just a file into repository as a generic point? So partly you answered the question because you're referring to data site, but it's not necessarily the case. For example, PDVs are not actually actual uh, contained as actual repositories as, as files, but they're more like on the database world. So I think you should make this distinction. Um, or if you can explain us what, what you think is a research, because you use, you use data set and research data, which are different depending on uh, the connotation and the context. So if you can clarify on this. The second point is the following is more on the Sweden uh, Swedish presentation. You, you, you mentioned um, a correlation between uh, the, 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 the senior scientist and the data sets. And there, I have to raise a point, I discussed this with, with Lorenz about this. Um, we should be care, careful about supplementary material because uh, uh, most publications come out with three, four, five files uploaded in a repository that are not resource data. They're figures or features or tables. And these are numbers that tremendously affect our ability to understand what's going yeah. on, right? So this is a, a major point. I, there may be solutions out there, but be careful because those numbers, because we went through the same issue in the past, can really bias a lot uh, your judgment. Thank you, Paolo. Perhaps I can start and then Max, and I think you, you want to add on that. I will start from the supplementary material because this is something we certainly discussed in the project. I think one of the first points that Max mentioned is we should make sure we focus on the real data and not the figures, figure 34, like it was mentioned yesterday in a different presentation. So yes, you're right. And you know we are aware that we should differentiate. We want to differentiate. But as you pointed out, Paolo, I think you were alluding at that, it's pretty tricky, it's not straightforward. So we're not there yet. That's uh, right now, you, what you say is everything that is being called uh, or anything that is being defined as research data, again, I'm gonna refer to data sites because by and large, that's the corpus. Um, so the different research data categories, data sets, image videos, and you and I discussed about image videos, content types as well, but. But you're right, so we need to, one big step that needs to happen is that we um, clearly identify the, 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 the set of research data that really matter. And Max, perhaps you can say that in your words. Yeah. I mean, um, this is of course a well-known problem and um, a part of this exercise is to identify, but then also really look into the numbers, are they interpretable and all this, and then leading to suggestions. Uh, what kind of additional metadata do we need to add into the systems? And uh, as everyone knows, I mean, what is raw data is a matter of definition. And what is, uh, I mean, the core data is also a matter of definition. And what is an outcome table? I mean, an outcome table could be raw data for meta-analysis. And yeah, you have all these different issues here. So um, we will never come to one solution but we will need to add more information and be better in differentiating presenting uh, separating the different numbers uh, for yeah what we are measuring so th this is really i mean why we're doing it this is to see can we really get something that is interpretable and how could we improve the uh, understanding of the results by adding more information I think, I mean, as I said, there is a number of this kind of projects and everyone are running into this kind of issues. 
um, but we, together we need to find better solutions and better definitions. Thank you. Maybe if I can add, um, is it still uh, audible? Yeah. Um, I think it was um, a similar point was discussed yesterday in a session around citations and metrics or record level citations and metrics. And I think one of the comments from the audience or anyway, part of the discussion was, you know, uh, we are still not there when it comes to perfection of metrics. And I think the same applies very much here. But as it was discussed yesterday, I believe, we believe that we need to start walking in the right direction and then over time iterate and improve. Because if we don't start measuring and then, you know, improving the data, improving the indicators, we will never get there. By creating this visibility, we have this discussion with the audience, with the community, and then we can focus on improving the, improving the indicators. Any more comments, thoughts, ideas? We like ideas. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So that's why we're here. So hopefully we can learn a lot from you. Uh, not yet. <laughs> hello. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, there's yes. a hand raised in the, the Zoom. Oh, hello. Uh, hi, uh, Ian Krinaskiewicz from uh, the UK. Um, I work at Public Library of Science, but um, I'm wearing uh, a hat as co-chair of the data policy uh, group uh, while I'm at the RDA. Um, thanks very much for sharing all the work that you've done. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, what I observed with the, uh, with the framework in particular with regards to outcome indicators is, and it seems like it was an intentional decision, but it seems to be a focus on what I would call best practices or good practices for data sharing. So looking for items in repositories, looking for things that have persistent identifiers, looking for data sets that are linked to publications, which 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 is a very good thing. Um, I wonder about the extent to which you have also thought about measuring other less optimal approaches to data sharing. Um, and I say that in part because while use of repositories is, of course, what we want to see, it's still a practice that is only carried out by the minority. Um, around 30% of content that we've analyzed in the project that I'm working on at PLOS has found that use of repositories is still in the minority. So um, I'm curious about the role you see or, or the importance of also measuring what researchers are doing now while being mindful of where we want to get them to. Um, so I'm curious if, if you've thought about that issue um, and how that might fit in this framework. Thank you for the question. Anyone that wants to share thoughts, otherwise I can share some thoughts. Um, I think it's from Zoom, by the way. I was trying to look at the audience, but <laughs> Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a very insightful question, and I have to say, uh, no, we haven't uh, given a lot of thoughts in the direction that you have suggested. I think you raise a good point, so probably something to consider, but uh, but no, at this point, um, where we have gotten to is, a, is an analysis, is a snapshot of where we are today, you know, starting from, as I said, the data site set of repositories mostly. Uh, and um, I think it suggests a good next step, to be honest. I don't know if anybody here wants to add something. Yeah, I, I think we, uh, at this po point in time, we are um, kind of making do with what metadata sources are available. Um, and uh, since this is a, a pilot project, we have only looked at uh, what has, uh, what we have been able to do in a reasonable time frame, but, uh, um, performing and measuring uh, that kind of uh, output is, is a lot more uh, complex and uh, would take a lot more time to do in a, a, an exhaustive way. I agree. The best practices are basically also the kind of data where we can extra good metadata, which we can track, they coincide. So it's kind of natural to start at that end. I agree. 
Thanks for the the response. Just a, a quick follow up. I think um, the focus on um, monitoring from metadata seems to be part of the the constraint there. Um, I'll drop a, a link into the chat to some results of uh, the project I was referring to, where we were able to look at full text and and able to explore other ways of data sharing. Um, some of the backgrounds there as well, just in case it's of interest. But thank you very much for the response. Looking forward to see what comes next. Thank you. Hi, this is Yang Wang from TU Delft. I'm also co-chairing uh, uh, RDA interest group called Professionalizing Data Stewardship. So it's thanks very much for the presentation and sharing the experience. It's very inspiring, especially it's really nice to see you include one indicator about the support staff uh, in the institutional level, if I remember correctly. So from our experience, it seems the role the support staff, data steward and any, any other RDM support staff they play has a very direct influence to the researcher's behavior to also all the guidance uh, policies and anything you would like to measure about the art, uh, open research data behavior. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, is there a plan or what will be more, uh, if you could share more insights about that indicator and whether you, there, is there any plan that you would like to further see the, how the connection between that indicator of research support to other indicators. Um, from our experience, we just see that indicator seems, seems to have a, man, a much more important role can play and has impact on the general objective that you would like to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I would just like to state that I think that the, the, the measure of the number of support staff per researchers kind of coincides with a lot of other stuff on institutional level. For example, do we have a small institution with a limited number of researchers? Do we have kind of homogeneous research fields with similar types of data throughout or uh, big universities, all kinds of data, and this also kind of affects the effectiveness of RDM support. So to really put the measure into a broader context, we would stay, need to take in a lot of other information as well. But, <clears throat> I mean, um, now we are trying to develop the indicators and then coming to more like a research stage, looking into, I mean, we have the hen and the egg, <laughs> what is causing what, uh, it would definitely open up that kind of um, more detailed studies, which, which we haven't thought about at this stage, but uh, it's something to, carry forward in some way. Thank you. And if I may add, I, it's great to hear about that. I know that uh, the TU Delft, in the, at least in the Netherlands, is one of the most advanced uh, institutions when it comes to RDM. Um, um, I think we have an hypothesis that the, the support staff will help best practices in universities. So it's great to hear your experience that confirms that. Um, as Max said, at this point, we're, we are trying to take a snapshot of the status quo. And then I think in one future step, we will want to see correlations or causations between, you know, institutions with more uh, support staff are correlated to uh, be better practices. And then I think from that type of analysis, we will be able to extract best practices that can be adopted by uh, other institutions. So. It's a long journey, but these are the insights we're looking for. And thanks for sharing your experience. Um, so coming from a research funder, I'm particularly interested in, um, you know, the extent to which grant holders are complying with data sharing requirements. Um, and uh, because of this, I was really um, struck by your slides uh, that uh, focused in on um, the percentage of uh, uh, publications that link to a data set because that's been the main method by which we track compliance with our data sharing policies. Um, and that's because, you know, you can, uh, well, for example, in the context of COVID, um, all COVID related publications were made open access. And then, you know, you can look up um, which uh, articles are funded by CIHR because that's acknowledged. Researchers have to acknowledge that. And then you take a sample of those articles and then you see which ones link to a data set and you use and then extrapolate out for the broader trend. And that's what you use as your indicator for whether or not uh, researchers are complying with your policies. 
Um, so my question is, um, in the Swed Swedish context, um, with respect to trying to understand the degree to which um, research, uh, Swedish researchers are complying with policies, is that currently the main indicator that you would be looking at? Uh, the, the degree to which uh, uh, publications uh, link to a data set, or would you be looking at other things? Thank you for the question. Max, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, the publications is, of course, a part of it. Uh, but I mean, some projects are funded more to create data um, and then, of course, just sharing this data in an appropriate way would be a good indicator. Uh, I'm thinking I was in um, in one of the committees for the Welcome Trust for six years, and uh, there, um, I mean, this is a little bit before talking about indicators, but uh, the funder, the Welcome Trust, they paid the last 20% of the grant when data was made available and also following up uh, that they used open um, yeah, open publications. Um, so uh, there are, of course, a combination here, like we are pointing out that we also need uh, the funders' uh, commitment in this work. But from my perspective, it's both, I mean, we definitely need to look into the data as such. It's not just the publications here. Um, it doesn't really answer your question, but uh, but it's for sure in our mind. <laughs> but how to do it is more complicated, of course. No, that's really illuminating. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and funders, at least in Canada, like anytime we have, like we do not have a universal data sharing requirement in Canada. Um, in in COVID, um, there was a requirement for data sharing. Often, when we do require data sharing, it's framed in the context of data supporting the publication. So then there's that very strong link. Um, but that then leaves this gap um, when it comes to projects uh, that are really uh, oriented towards data creation, you know, and, and the, then the difficulties of actually monitoring for that and compliance with that. Thank you. Uh, if I may, actually, I, I'd be curious to um, hear more about the experience you have. You may, so do I understand it correctly that uh, the main indicator used at CIHR is data sets linked to publications? In this instance, it was. So um, so for all of CIHR's COVID-related funding opportunities, um, you know, they had to be immediately open access, which was easy to track because publishers committed to making them open access, but they also had to um, make the data accessible. Um, so in this uh, for, in this context, that's the that's the method we pursued. Like look up a, a sample of the, the publications and then see if they if they link to the data and then extrapolate out. Not a perfect method by any means, but it was it, it seemed to be the best one because uh, otherwise it was just very hard to track. Um, like, first of all, how to find like um, CIHR outputs, you know, like even if, a, uh, even if a researcher is kind of sharing just a data set, I, I don't think it, they're not required to, and I don't think it's typical to acknowledge CIHR like in the metadata. So you got to get to that, that acknowledgement and that that's why you look towards the publication and then you have to so it's a very labor intensive process i mean ideally there'd be more kind of automated methods or something or ideally you know we cihr would um implement uh, a, a requirement that you know grant holders have to acknowledge uh, cihr funding in the meta, in the metadata of the data set and then presumably that could if not immediately then in time uh, enable it uh you know easier tracking uh of uh uh, data being made available, but that that was the main inst um, the, the method in that instance. But you know we're very actively uh, investigating like other possible methods that could be a more accurate, b less labor intensive. Um, but you know one illuminating thing about one very illuminating thing about the the Swedish um, uh, kind of context and what you pull together is I mean it, how comprehensive it is uh, in, in Canada right now. I mean we're very focused on like the output uh, at least at CIHR, whereas I was really um, intrigued, and I, I would love to get the slides because I do like that more comprehensive uh, framework looking into all these different elements. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I'm Marta Piperek and I'm for 40U Research Data, which is a repository of data and software nationally for the Netherlands. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank, you, thank you very much, by the way, for sharing your findings, what you're trying to do. I think it's amazing and I fully agree with you that we have to start somewhere, you know, and uh, put something in there to, to be visible for us to have this discussion. So I fully agree with you. We try to do in the Netherlands, I guess, something similar, you know, how can we measure the implementation of fair practices nationally? And I have to say, we ended up with much more questions than the answers. So, you know, I was laughing a little bit when Paolo asked that question about what do you mean by data set that we got stuck on that for quite a while, you know, what is a data set? What Ian has been asking, you know, what about all the data sets that researchers should have, you know, in their storages, wherever, you know, should we be looking into that? Should we as institutions know? I guess we should have a better insight into what's out there, you know, what our researchers are working on. But, you know, I'm wondering, so we have been doing this work in the Netherlands, you are doing this beautiful work in Sweden, and you came publicly speaking about this, I could ask you a million questions about the content, you know, so like the previous colleague from the Canadian funding body, I would love if you could share some more insight, like a report or presentations details, that would be wonderful. But it's a question, I guess, to us all, like, would it be of interest to have some kind of more group, like re create a group within RDA, maybe including funders, maybe national representatives to really look into how can we agree on the ba basic indicators for us, you know, to move forward with that, because that question is repeatedly being addressed. I'm not familiar now with all the groups, you know, within RDA, maybe that's already being done, but if not, perhaps that's something that we should really urgently form and uh, agree on that minimal thing we do, you know, because I guess we could share with you the bugbears, the questions we don't have the answers to. I'm sure you struggle with many, and I'm sure that many people in the audience are probably struggling with the same. So maybe that's a moment to join forces. Perhaps a naive question, but, you know, I would be curious what people think in general about that. Thank you, Marta. Um, I can, can just, uh, I mean, this is not really an answer, but a comment <laughs> to your comment that, that uh, I mean, that's what we aim for here was to be rather pragmatic to try to get numbers and then from there try to develop. And so it's a little bit like you say, not be stuck on definitions and all these kind of things. But then, of course, these weaknesses uh, are for sure uh, in our data, but um, a good way of, to improve for the future is, of course, to uh, get these numbers and uh, have these discussions. And it could be in RDA. Um, we have, have not really decided how to carry it forward, but uh, we would like to broaden it to definitely this project. Um, and we will never come to the really perfect indicators, but uh, we will have something that are interpretable that's the our main intention here and uh, we're very happy to get input from other projects i mean there are a number of projects of course so, thanks yeah, we, uh, we are we are all a bit lost and we are all <laughs> looking for some kind of authority um, in these matters but we need to find some some kind of agreement uh, I, I agree with you can so, i Martha, uh, something probably to follow up on and to consider because indeed, if we can reuse and leverage and join forces, and you can go faster. Um, and I think, I just want to add, I think, in my view, we'll have to keep some level of pragmatism, because if we look for perfection, we'll probably discuss for five years and we will not get uh, anywhere. So we'll have to strike that balance between good enough and making progress and then iteration. Can I just uh, add a plug for this afternoon? Richard Pitts from Oracle. Um, with the RDA, we are forming a working group to discuss open data, and uh, I shall be talking about this about this this afternoon. And we really value everyone's input to to that discussion. Just to comment on what's been said just now, I think definitions and understanding what we mean by open data is an incredibly complicated subject. We have a product out there now. You can Google Oracle Open Data and see what we're doing at the moment. But it's not there yet, and I'm really keen that we can that we get as much input from this organization as possible to develop something with everyone that uh, will answer this problem in the long term. 
but I'm really impressed with what you've presented today and what the Netherlands is doing. It's, uh, it's a very impressive piece of work, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, I am uh, Javier Albacete from the European Commission. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, I would simply like to add uh, another item to the wish list, <laughs> which I missed somehow in the study, and it is the data management plans. I guess that in some subspace of the metadata that is available on which the study is, is based, uh, especially to those data records that are linked to publications and mostly grants, it should be possible, I'm, I'm asking, I don't really know, to get information about data management plans. Uh, and that is critical because, well, some funders, you know, data management plans are mandatory for some funders. They are for the programs of the uh, of the European Union, of the Horizon Europe Framework Program. And, well, that they are mandatory for a reason because they are expected to, well, uh, to, to, to encourage researchers at the beginning of the project to think and to plan carefully how they are going to manage their data. And this is expected, this reflection exercise and making it public because it is at least for us a mandatory deliverable to trigger a larger number of uh, data sharing records. So it would be very interesting. And I think it may be possible with the current uh, tools that we are using to look into it at least to, to, some, to some extent. So that is my, my item in the wish list if possible. And second, the general remark, uh, which is the fact that the well, a survey that we ran recently on the European data landscape shows that the single uh, most important blocking element for researchers to share their data is the issue of rewards and recognition. So more than 50% of them indicated that, like, so in short is where should I do it? I mean, what am I getting out of that? I understand that tracking rewards and incentives with the methods that you are currently using is probably far out of scope, but uh, that is certainly a critical issue that I encourage you to take into consideration in further steps and evolutions of this study. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anyone wants to uh, comment on this question? I completely agree about your last point about the need for there to be incentives and reward for researchers. When I'm looking at the kind of leveling off data we saw in Sweden, what comes to my mind is that we need to give researchers good reasons to publish data. And currently there might be not enough good reasons. And what if institutions start tracking, registering, publishing data sets kind of more aggressively, if I don't want to use the word aggressively, but more confidently on the departmental level. What if maybe published data sets might be a factor affecting departmental funding for research? That would be an enormous incentive. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, to um, proper re properly reward a researcher, the research assessment part of a uh, research asset that I, I think we have a glitch okay yeah uh, so, so to make that possible um, there has to be uh, metrics and for metrics there has to be some kind of indicator so we have a, a big circle of of life here <laughs> uh, but but uh, I think that a project like this one uh, could possibly kickstart that process and and um, make met metrics available and and um, in turn reward researchers for their output. Um, yes, the DMP is of course something also that we take the usage of DMP. So thank you. Yeah, I I wanted to add. Um, I think on both points, I agree very much. DMPs, yes, they are a critical elements. Although I want to share my personal experience or my personal observation, I may say, yes, they're very important. We should uh, promote them, we should track them, but we should not stop at DMPs because 
sometimes DMPs are an empty, uh, you know, an empty project management document that is not followed up. So yes, we want to have them. Yes, we want to help researchers to do a good job. And then we also want to help them to follow through their plan. Um, that's my observation there. And rewards is uh, an absolute need if we want, I believe, if we want to see data sharing really take off. Um, I think very often we talk about the stick, you know, and the, the penalties that funders have in their hands if there is no data sharing, but we really need to accelerate on the rewards and the carrots. I think that will move a lot of minds. Uh, kia ora. Hello, it's Nick Jones here from New Zealand, from the New Zealand Science Infrastructure. Um, I just, I loved what you were doing there and it connected for me with some work that's going on in Australia. Uh, they've got a program called the Research Data Culture Conversation. And it's been going on since about 2017, working across the research sector. And they've asked a simple question, how much research data are you storing? And it turns out it's really hard to answer that question. So what they've discovered is the institutions are mostly storing data for compliance reasons. And those are not individually identifiable data sets. It's just data that's stored and they can't separate it from the, the sort of digital corpus of, of, of stuff. So they can't tell you how much is actually stored that's first copy. They can't tell you how much is open. They can't tell you how much is published. But it really talks to some of these incentive discussions because really the institutions are mostly complying with institutional incentives. And the research incentives are not part of that picture. So I'll come and have a chat to some of you afterwards because I think it's a really interesting project and I'm sure there's some good connection there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Any more thoughts, questions, perhaps on the line, Guillaume? Uh, online questions actually were repeated to, to some extent. Um, there was a focus on software, questions about uh, the, uh, from Ian. So, but um, I, th I think I answered most of them online. Okay, thank you. Then perhaps, you. yeah, over to you. So I'm Hilary Hanahu from the Research Data Alliance. Maybe I'd just like to underline um, Marta's request. And I think we discussed it a little bit Guillaume, before the session um, of thinking seriously about how to use the Research Data Alliance facilities to amplify a little bit your work and collect feedback. That's what we're here for. I appreciate it's a specific project, um, but I think that you would, you and the community would gain an awful lot from it. So what we can do uh, as the Research Data Alliance is try to uh, help you to identify the best approach to this. I know we'll be speaking after the plenary about it, but uh, I, I think there seems to be a lot of interest and ways and things that can be shared with you, that it would be a really missed opportunity. And that's our job to reduce the duplication of efforts and ensure that things are more open. So I uh, I offer our help to try and take this forward. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm CJ Woodford from the World Data Systems International Technology Office in Canada, and speaking on behalf of the Global Open Research Commons Working Group, um, following up on Hillary's comment and Marta's comment, we've actually been putting together a list of uh, key performance indicators and metrics like you have, and so there is some duplication happening in the community. Um, our group has been hesitant to evaluate uh, KPIs, as we call them. Um, because we have a whole other body of work about attributes and features of um, data commons and commons in general. So I think that it would actually be really timely for a RDA group to come into the picture that focuses specifically on key performance indicators and metrics. Um, and we would be, I, I'm speaking out of my own personal opinion, of course, I need to check with my co-chairs on this too, but I think it would be really great to pass over the work that we've already compiled and combine it with the work that you've done to see where are the intersections and um, and move it forward together, as has been said previously. So an invitation to uh, to work together, I guess. 
Thank you for that and sharing your experience. I guess uh, probably the best is to uh, have a chat after this session. And uh, But thank you. Any more questions, thoughts, ideas? Paolo? Uh, just to add to what you mentioned before, so to, uh, about the approach and to find a way that is pragmatic enough to have valuable numbers without you know, getting stuck into philosophical questions. Um, I wonder if, the, oh, I love data side just to, <laughs> but I wonder if the choice of picking repositories that only have DOIs uh, is wise enough because uh, many institutions do not have that, but they have very good repositories uh, which are used at the national level and the reliable and I mentioned in CNR, for example. CNR, we store everything that we produce internally in a big thing that is a catch-all repository that includes data, includes software. We use, use it for evaluation, internal evaluation. So uh, I think Ian also has written something there in the comments uh, online. So I wonder if there is an analysis or if it's just the simplest thing you can do because if we have a DOI, everything is easier. We can properly cite, we can, but having a DOI does not necessarily ensure quality. Uh, frankly, if you investigate a little bit deeper, <laughs> probably. So I wonder what's the rationale behind this choice and if it's revisable. HAL doesn't have UIs. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, well, it's, it's basically a matter of, of uh, uh, taking the easiest approach with, uh, within a short time frame, but I, 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 uh, I, I agree with you. Um, ignoring uh, those kinds of data publication um, channels could could uh, could skew the results of course because uh, discipline specific repositories have um, different practices and so of course we would be missing out on a lot of of the published data by only including um, duis so that's that's a weakness of of, of our approach of course So if the idea is to come up with numbers that somehow uh, map a, a nation, a country, or an institution, uh, and make it comparable to others in Europe, for example, to identify trends and so on, and you're missing uh, a large part of the products that are being published, again, in France, they have HAL. HAL is a super cool thing, right? So they really do things properly. They're, there's metadata curation. They're connected to software heritage. They do so many things in a proper way would be out of this evaluation. So the, when you're evaluating, allow me this word, this term, runs, you're missing a large chunk of things. So I know that it's hard to move beyond the DOIs because that's a really simple thing. But that reminds me of the story of the, the drunk guy who loses his house keys and searches behind the lamp because there's a light there, but <laughs> I lost them there in the dark, right? Because <laughs> it's simple, but maybe it's, takes you out a little bit of the rail. Thank you, Paul. It's a valid comment. I don't know if anybody, Max, you want to add? No, uh, no it's just uh, to stress that, I mean, this is the beginning and then of course we will uh, include more and more. So like Andrea said that uh, this was given a very short time point period and uh, we had to do something and, but. Thank you, and it's very valid. I mean, it's the same case in Sweden, of course, also, and all other countries, so, yes. Thanks. Yeah, I have um, another question or comments. I'm uh, Joachim Meus, a research funder in Flanders, Belgium. Um, following up on the matter of DOIs, I think it should be beneficial also to think about guidelines for DOIs, because researchers, I have the impression, are also a bit lost they, at least uh, in our experience, they want the OIs because, yeah, they can refer to it. And as for the silly, silliest things, maybe sometimes a website or to have a DOI for a website. So guidelines for DOIs and to uh, try to clean up uh, a little bit or classify a little bit more uh, is very urgent, I think. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to add also in Flanders, part of Belgium, we're trying to 
make KPIs. Um, so very happy to, I'm also very interested to uh, exchange ideas about that. Um, also there, we found out that linking objects uh, like research data, like funding, um, linking to art journal articles is also crucial, I think, for our uh, future. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else who has ideas um, should be shared? It if I may, from Zoom, uh, make another comment. It's Ian from PLOS. Sure. Um, there was some discussion about um, whether the RDA um, could have more attention on this, this topic of monitoring. Um, I, I thought I'd share a couple of examples of other things that I'm aware of in case um, others, others in, in the room aren't aware of them. Uh, UNESCO was mentioned. There's a working group to develop an open science monitoring framework as part of the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Um, I can put a link into the collaborative document, but that seems particularly relevant. Um, very broad thinking about lots of different aspects, lots of different indicators of open science. Um, there's also um, a group of, I suppose, meta researchers and tool developers um, thinking about some of these problems called the screen it group. Um, which I think is coordinated by the Quest Centre in Berlin. And very recently, the UK Reproducibility Network, um, there are international networks, but they, they tend to be groups of institutions that care about reproducibility. They, a week ago or so, launched a call for expressions of interest in what they're calling open research indicators. Um, so agreeing that there, there's quite a lot going on, so maybe there is an opportunity to globally share problems and solutions to um, to this topic. Great, thank you for sharing this. I suppose you shared the link, so we'll also be able to access them. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Joyce Mapanyani. I come from Botswana, Geospatial Sciences, and I'm part of a RDA Council. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent, the excellent work you are doing. Uh, my comment is that uh, when you collect data like this, you really have to make some planning because otherwise it will be just data there. Uh, make a thought of uh, how is it going to be accessible to other people? the standards, is that publication information just there? Or are you putting it in a certain form of standards? Are you formatting it in a way of data which, which needs security or data which can be accessed by the public? Uh, what are your plans? If there's additional data to the information, to the publication you have already uh, put in your database. Uh, somebody earlier on talked about database management. Database management is crucial into, in the initial stages of uh, putting uh, information like that. It is to avoid uh, having to do a lot of work afterwards to correct and uh, analyze, you know, is very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your experience and thoughts. Any more thoughts, questions? Um, just a second thought. Good morning, Dieter van Uitvank uh, from Claren Eric, uh, Research Infrastructure for uh, Language Resources. 
um, I would very much uh, support uh, creation and the idea of having kind of a working group on this topic, because if only there's a kind of a repeated stream of requests um, that come to us, but also to many of our centers and repository owners to um, yeah, comment on the topic, to provide data. And I see a lot of repeated discussions here. And I think the RDA is actually the ideal forum to ensure that there's no kind of reinventing of the wheel on the topic. And also that we share data internally because um, Personally, one of my biggest frustrations is a kind of constant stream of questionnaires that come to us through all kind of forums, very well, um, yeah, um, um, I have to say motivated, of course. But the thing is, we're repeating the messages and we're repeating it, and it's not kind of being shared. I think actually the, the lessons learned from um, yeah, topics like this is, is an ideal topic to be shared actively with others and especially also at kind of international level because lots of the uh, information we're sharing is currently at the European level which makes sense we're a European research infrastructure but I think there's a lot to be learned there internationally so I would uh, very much support the uh, creation of uh, yeah, interest group or working group on the topic thanks thank you so much can I ask you sorry again your affiliation I I couldn't ah, hear sorry it. Claren Eric uh, research infrastructure for language resources and tools thank you so much Of course, we should we should, would support this working group, but uh, there are many projects out there already funded by the Commission. They are working exactly on these topics. Okay, so one that we are part of is called Grasp OS. Uh, we share the pointer, where we're trying to do exactly the same thing. So we have uh, institutions, we have uh, communities, which come up with requirements in terms of indicators, open science indicators, to track and monitor the evolution of science and its. Uh, open science trends, but also uh, assessment in different forms. And when uh, the nations are involved, they come up with their national roadmaps and the ideas they have on the new evolution of uh, indicators. And on the other hand, we have different sources, open sources or open data sources that can be used. And the project will deliver tools to connect the two. So to connect the requests and the demands and see how the data can match these demands because some of the questions are more narrative on the narrative CVs. Right. Others are numbers and indicators. So the project is three years, I think, very open to collaboration with uh, with others. And there's Leiden, who's very well known for the indicators and this kind of stuff. Of course, open air, open citations, others are participating. So it's interesting. I'll share the link on, on the minutes. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to share thoughts, ideas? All right. Well, anything else from the panel? Any more thoughts um, coming from the discussion? Andre, Max, Merlin. Well, I, I think that uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of possible indicators, like, like we heard, for example, uh, tracking uh, reproducibility. Uh, how, uh, in what extent, uh, to what extent uh, reproducibility packages are being published, but it's really hard to track in the, uh, um, you, you really have to, to um, examine it uh, almost manually. So, so uh, uh, I think we should, should aim uh, towards um, getting, getting the things on board that are easy to do right now, and um, then have some kind of roadmap for uh, our wish list <laughs> of what to include, and uh, and that there should be an, an open discussion about uh, the possible uh, approaches. Thank you, Andre. So pragmatism should say top of mind to make sure we can progress and improve as we go. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yes. Thank you. It was it was actually one of the outcomes of our discussions and when looking at the data over and over again it came very clear that one very simple I would say not simple but if one thing needs to be done it's share your data with your publication if funders could ask this and check this I think it would make a huge difference to kickstart any further improvements but before looking at FAIR the first thing is it's what we try and show is the first thing is share your data so by looking at 
is your publication, does your publication have data attached to it? It's the first step and it would it would help immensely. It's pretty simple to, to track. So yeah, I I want to uh add on that I very much support that point in terms of you know pragmatism, but also what is the first step? I also personally believe that focusing on publications and focusing on linking data to publications would be a great first step. And again, it's only part of the scope because there is there are projects that are meant not to publish articles, but just data. So that doesn't cover it. But I think it would be a very big step, probably relatively easy to track and uh, to implement. So it's one of those things where, you know, from an 80-20 type of point of view, that would probably be a, a good uh, measure. But this is just ideas, right? We, we haven't, you know, we haven't uh, come to this conclusion. I'm sharing my thoughts now as part of this uh, discussion. Uh, Guillaume, anything else on the line? No, there are some links have been shared. So some in, a lot of interesting material. I don't know how will be uh, communicated to the wider audience, but yes, there's a way. Uh, the mic, Dimas? Dimas. So there's a collaborative notes document for every session. And some of the people have been dropping things in and I've put some of the names in. But uh, you should use that because yes, you aren't a group yet. You're a birds of a feather session. But I think it will be interesting to share with some of the people. And again, we can help you in doing that. So I did, Ian has put his links in. I think Paolo put some things in as well. And they are linked from the session page on the web platform. I think Hoover doesn't have the link, I'm sorry. But so we and you will get access to that, and we will ask you for your slides if that's okay, so we can make no them problem. available they will to be the made. participants. Because remember that this session was recorded, so people will be able to watch it afterwards as well, and yeah. you know might be really interested in it. Thanks. Oh, one more point actually. Hi, I'm Ellen. Um, I should have asked this earlier, but could everyone in the panel just present themselves and where they are from? So I missed that part. Yeah, thank you. I You reminded me of a duty probably I should have uh, done myself. So perhaps I start. I'm Lorenzo Ferri. I'm part of Elsevier. I've been working in RDM for the last four and a half years, part of this community for the last four and a half years. Perhaps, Andre? Yeah, I'm, I'm Andre Janun. Uh, I'm a, a, a research data advisor at the Swedish National Data Service. And Max, you introduce yourself. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm <laughs> Max Petzold, the head of the Swedish National Data Service. And I'm Marlene de Schmidt. I'm a data steward at Stockholm University Library, and I'm representing Stockholm University on this project. And I'm Guillaume Wernin. I'm also with Elsevier. I worked on the data and I, I work specifically in the Netherlands on the open science projects. So Thanks. thank you. All right. Uh, we are a few minutes ahead of time. I think it's the right time to hand over to you, Max, for the final thoughts and conclusion. <laughs> yeah. um, I more or less only would like to thank everyone for coming and all these good ideas. Uh, so the main task for us is to try to merge all the ideas, uh, links, names, whatever, together to come up with a good plan and in relation to RDA, um, get help from RDA, how to how this work could fit into what is already ongoing in different groups. So let's see what we can do, but we are very happy to get this input and um, we will for sure continue with this pragmatic um, approach and try to develop uh, more numbers and then uh, let the major and become more and more use, useful and hopefully together with more collaborators then. So thanks for coming and um, now it's time for coffee as far as I know. Thank you.